Good evening, everyone. I'm coming to you this afternoon from the parsonage, from uh, the living room of the parsonage, and it's raining outside. We've, we've had a little bit of rain today. Been working in the garden this morning and uh, just trying to stay busy and a little productive uh, as much as I can. I hope all of you are having a great week. I know it's Holy Week, and we wish that we were together. We wish that we were in the house of the Lord where we could worship and, and praise him and celebrate him, but we can worship and praise him uh, from the places that we find ourselves today. I wanted to share with you what would have happened uh, on Tuesday, today's Tuesday, and so I wanted to uh, tell you what happened on Tuesday of Holy Week. And there's uh, one story that I wanna share with you that, that I feel is uh, just a, a very, powerful story uh, when Jesus was anointed. Uh, he was anointed in Bethany after a hard day. Now, now hear this. On Tuesday, uh, many historians call this a messianic polemic, and it's a day of challenge and controversy. Uh, they had controversies everywhere that day uh, from the religious crowds who reacted to his authority and asking by what authority do you do these things and do you say these things? Uh, it was on this day that he taught in parables. He solemnly denounced the religious leaders as blind guides and hypocrites. And after leaving that afternoon, as he often did, he would go back to the Mount of Olives. And there he gave uh, a discourse uh, concerning the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem and end times. That's very important. And it tells that you'll be, you'll be able to tell the, uh, the times uh, of, the, uh, of coming and it'll be a time when uh, Jerusalem will be destroyed and, and he was warning the people that this was coming upon them. And he, he tells all these things and, and uh, teaches them to be watchful. That would be more important for us today that's, again, the Word of God is just as relevant to us as it was when he spoke it to the disciples. It was, it was important for them to be watchful. It was important for them uh, to understand the, the changes and the things that are going to happen. It's important for us today uh, that we be watchful, watchful for the coming of the Lord again, to see the signs, to see uh, how things are going to uh, come about. And so as he goes back uh, that night to Bethany, uh, this is where uh, the scripture is from Matthew 26, uh, begin with verse 6. I want to read this in its entirety to you. Uh, from Matthew 26, 6, it says, Now when Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial of very uh, costly perfume. And she poured it upon his head as he reclined at the table. But the disciples were indignant when they saw this and said, Why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold uh, for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed to me. You see, uh, for the poor you have with you always, but you do not always have me. And when she poured this perfume upon my body, she did it to prepare me, to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done shall also be spoken of in memory of her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, we look at this and we wonder, uh, why is this integral now? Why is this important to us today as we look at what happened that, that night? It seems insignificant, maybe. It, it just seems like another person loving Jesus, just as we love Jesus. Uh, sometimes we do things that uh, we don't even understand why we do things. We, uh, we want to celebrate uh, that's one of the things that 
that's very hurtful for us now is we're not able to go into the temple. We're not able to go into the sanctuary. We're not able to join together with our friends and our neighbors and, and our loved ones and, and worship God. That has become very important to us. And I hope, and it's my prayer each night, that maybe this is a wake-up call for us of just how important worship is, just how important that worship is for our lives today. You see, sometimes we get complacent. Sometimes we become too familiar, too familiar with the church and too familiar with our friends, too familiar with uh, things that are happening in our lives. And we miss, we miss something. And we think that, we, that we're open to uh, what's being shown to us. We think that we're open and, and able to reason. We're, we think that we're able to uh, surmise uh, important things that's right before us. But sometimes those things that are right before us become too familiar. And that's what was happening Monday and Tuesday of Holy Week. You see... The people have become so familiar with the sanctuary that they turned it into a, a, a brood of vipers. It, it angered Jesus, and he turned over the tables. He was a strong man, and he turned over the tables very quickly and, and ran out the, the people that were cheating. You see, they were cheating. They had all kind of plots to where they could cheat the people to uh, get some money, extra money. They were just profiting off of the temple. They weren't worshiping like they should have been. Sure, they understood who God was in their life. Their parents had taught them. Uh, the rabbi had taught them. Even Jesus had taught them. But they had become so familiar that they thought that they understood everything and that it was okay for what they were doing. They were exchanging money, maybe make a little bit towards their side, uh, maybe maybe help out with uh, the things that they'd like to do uh, in the church, or, or maybe they're even thinking about how this could be uh, a, a windfall, a profit for the poor. After all, people love the poor. They, uh, they, they seem to want to do for people that are uh, in need. So it's a very noble thing to, to think about. But look at how familiar they had become that they just did things that were totally against what Jesus was teaching them. They forgot about the worship of God. I pray and my prayer is that when we're able to go back into the temple, when we're able to go back into the, uh, the sanctuary here in Dadeville, that it will set our hearts on fire. That we'll realize that, yes, we worshiped on the lake. Yes, we worshiped on the, up on the towers. We worshiped on the highways. We worshiped uh, in the streets and on the parks. We could worship anywhere. But how wonderful it is to be in this place of worship. It's holy. It's treasured by our hearts. Now, we want... Uh, to, to feel this connection with God here in this holy place. So maybe it'll set our hearts on fire and we'll be more committed to worship. We'll be more committed to the things that Jesus had taught and the things that's pleasing unto God. As we see the familiarity of the disciples, they also were very familiar with the temple. They were very, very familiar with the temple. They probably even, as children, sang songs uh, of how uh, that their forefathers, their and maybe their great grandfathers or uh, or older, maybe they had worked building that temple. Maybe some of them uh, were their families were slaves, and and they had to work to build that temple. And then Jesus is walking out. They were admiring the beauty of the temple. They were admiring, the disciples were admiring the craftsmanship. They were, they were admiring the beauty of this temple that they had become so familiar with. You see, every day Jesus was taking them to the temple. 
and he would teach them. And then they would go back to the Mount of Olives and they would rest there. Or sometimes they would sleep there. Some nights they would uh, go back to Bethany. Tuesday, they decided uh, after all of this, they, they stopped Jesus there on the Mount of Olives and asked him to explain what he meant by that and how that uh, the temple would be destroyed. What would be the signs? And Jesus explained to them. But then they, as they looked at that, they couldn't, they couldn't truly trust or believe what they were hearing. You see, they, they knew how massive the structure was. They knew that the stones were so huge. When they were set upon each other, they were set there permanently. And it was not something they thought could ever be destroyed. But Jesus was telling them it would be destroyed. And not only that, he was talking about him, self. He was talking about, uh, we read in God's word about uh, that they can destroy this temple and on the third day I shall raise it up. We rejoice in that, don't we? We rejoice in that truth. But for them, they were, they were confused. How, could, how can you move these stones? How could you do these things? How could you just in three days raise up what took years and, and so many people, people lost their lives building this temple? Now we see that Jesus explained it more fully to them so that they would not be deceived, so that they would not be fooled anymore. And then as they go back to Bethany, they're in uh, the home of Simon the leper, and it's there that they're having a meal together. And while they're reclining there, maybe drinking some wine or, or maybe they're uh, finishing up the last of, of the things on their plate, in comes a woman. A woman comes in to, uh, to take all that she had in this world. She had a vial of uh, what we call nard. They would take the fat of the olives and they would place it into a porcelain uh, ceramic uh, alabaster jar. And it would be there that they would, they would take that and they would start with the fat of the olives. And then day by day, on into months and months each day, she would go out into the uh, into the fields and she would go into places where the flowers would be blooming and she would extract the oil. She would extract the oil, the precious oil. There wouldn't be very much of it that made the great fragrance. And she would put that in that fat of the olives and she would choose the, the mixture that she would want to, uh, to, to make and she was... Uh, busy each day trying to get enough of that so that she could get through another year. This We know that this woman was not married. Well, Brother Mike, how can you say that she wasn't married? We don't know that. Well, Jesus was the rabboni. Jesus was the rabbi. Jesus was the teacher. And no self-respecting woman would come and want to talk to Jesus. She would not put herself in that position. There were norms and there were, there were things that we followed, practices that they followed in that time. She would have sent her husband. If she wanted to give something to Jesus, she would have sent her husband and he would have given this gift and, and the family would have been proud and they would have uh, been part of something very special. But by her coming there alone, by her coming by herself, it said that she had no man. She had no husband. And probably everything she had was in that alabaster jar. That becomes important when we see that she so lavishly breaks open that jar and pours out all of that upon the feet of Jesus. And then she begins to, uh, to wash his feet with the fragrance of the, the nard, that perfume. 
she broke open that jar and she gave Jesus everything she had. We've become so familiar. That's a, a word I'm using a lot tonight. We've become so familiar with our relationship with God that we don't see truly everything that we should see. I think about this woman coming in and pouring it out and the disciples, the disciples, they were like, what's going on? Why would she do this? Why wouldn't she sell this? We could put it in our in our coffer here and it could help us in our in our journey in our ministry. She could have helped many people uh, that day with all that she had uh, saved up in that alabaster jar. There were no safety nets during that time. Think about the woman herself. She probably risked everything. If she had become sick, no one would have taken care of her. If she had become hungry, no one would have given her food. People just didn't take care of people like they should back then. And Jesus was trying to help them understand that they'll always have the poor. But they won't always have Jesus. They won't always have him. The disciples didn't get that. They couldn't see it. They, as, as Mark always said, they were dull. They, they were slow of thought. They, they just didn't get the things that they should be getting. And this is one of those moments. This is one of those moments where we see that if they had just understood, this woman was doing her great thing. She was coming and preparing Jesus was for what was about to become. They weren't going to have anything to do with that, disciples. They weren't going to have anything to do with that. They weren't even thinking that. They would not allow their minds to think such horrible things. And even when Jesus said that when they destroyed this temple on the third day, I will raise it up. They weren't getting what Jesus was about to do. They couldn't understand. See, they wanted a king. They wanted the king that would come and put them on top. For so long, they had been on the bottom of the pyramid. They had been uh, looked over and, and walked over. They had been abused and enslaved. They were ready for uh, God to come and send the Messiah to put them on top. Jesus didn't come to fulfill that prophecy. Jesus came to fulfill the prophecy of his Father in heaven. And he does so as he goes to the cross, as he sacrifices and becomes the Lamb of God, as he becomes the Lamb for our sacrifices so that we might be saved. I think about that this Holy Week, and I think about this woman and what she did that night after Jesus had been ridiculed and challenged how his own disciples didn't get what was happening. Now we see this woman gets it and she is anointing his body. She the only thing she had was that nard in her hair and there she would wipe his feet with her hair and washed his feet and prepared him just as any Jewish person would prepare someone that, has, that is dying to get them ready to, to go into the tomb. Here on Tuesday, Jesus was encountered this precious woman who was willing to sacrifice everything to worship him, to get on her knees and, and to wipe her hair on his feet, to wash his feet, this precious nard, this precious oil that meant everything to her. Have we become so familiar with Jesus today that, that we don't see who he truly is to us? What are we willing to do? What are we willing to give? What are we willing to sacrifice to be part of this story.
What are we willing to do that teaches those around us and tells others around us that Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And it's not about temples and, and buildings. It's about sacrifice. And it's about trust. It's about mercy and grace. It's about love. And now we see this beautiful thing that has been done for Jesus this Holy Week. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to give everything that we have, to risk everything that we are? Are we willing to be part of this story? I pray that you find yourself willing. For the Bible teaches us when you've done this unto the least of my brothers and sisters, when you've done this unto the poor, you have done it unto me. Think about how that we can sacrifice. Maybe it's during this pandemic. Maybe we can live with so much less. I've been living with less. Thank God I've prayed and, and, and fasted and, and asked God to take this uh, weight from me, uh, this physical weight. It was killing me. And in the last few months, I've lost 30 pounds. I feel better than I've ever felt before. And I'm, I'm so excited about that. It's hard. It's really hard right now because I can't go to the health store and I can't uh, go to uh, the trendy stores where you can find the things uh, that you can eat that are much more healthier. Uh, instead, I'm having to live out of my freezer like you are and I'm having to live out of my refrigerator and make, and make things go longer. I'm having to eat beans and rice and... Uh, and vegetables out of my garden, and and it's hard. It's hard for me to stay on that. So I said this week, I, maybe part of my sacrifice is to not get everything I want so quickly. And so I'm going to try to continue to eat the best that I can, and uh, exercise, and fast, and pray. All these things I know that will help me be better. Maybe, and, and I'll ask you to pray for me. Pray for me that. Uh, that uh, during this uh, outbreak that I'm not here and, and I'm nervous and eating more than I usually do, pray that I'm able to have the courage to do without, maybe do with a little less. I think we could all do that, can't we? I pray that you're yeah, during this time you'll be able to see that uh, you have been blessed with so much. And maybe God wants us to live with a little less so that we can do so much more, so that we can be part of the witness, so that we can be part of the blessing. Because when we've done it unto the least of my brothers and sisters, we have done it unto him. We've done it unto our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'll see you again tomorrow. Look forward to telling you about another uh, story about this great Holy Week as we build up to Easter Sunday. I know that it's hard having to stay at home. I know, but I, I pray that you will. I pray that you'll sacrifice a little more every day so for the well-being of our community. Pray for those that are sick. Pray for those that uh, have this horrible virus that they may be healed. And I'll see you tomorrow. God bless you.